At this time, we'll have the uh, reading of the text today, which we found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. So if you'll turn in your Bibles there. And I don't know what the standard Bible translation is in this church, but I'm reading from the New King James Version. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And may the Lord, the Holy Spirit of God, see fit to wing the truths of these uh, words to our hearts today as we consider them in the ministry. I have uh, tweaked the... Uh, title this message a little bit, not very much, but the uh, title as it appears as I gave to your pastor is Comfort One Another with Perusia Comfort, the word Perusia is being the Greek word for the second coming of Christ, and I've tweaked that just a little bit, Comfort One Another with Perusia Words, more of a focus upon the actual words that are found here. Now, congregation, a huge uh, Greek word in the New Testament that is used many, many times is the Greek word alelon, which is used at least 56 times and is usually translated one another. And so the church of Christ is a one anothering, fellowshipping society. Some samples of this. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. Still another, exhorting one another daily while it is called today, lest your hearts be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 13. And then still another, a new commandment, said Jesus, I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another, in John 13, the 34th verse. And here in 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse 18, Paul adds to these specimens, and he writes about the second coming of Christ to the congregation, and he says to all of the brothers, therefore comfort one another with these words. Now the question, of course, is, how is the Christian to be comforted? What is the uh, foundation of true comfort? What is the warp and the woof of this comfort? Well, a pithy answer to that question is, when you live as if Christ died for you yesterday, and that he has risen today, and that he is coming for you tomorrow. And that's the way it is. Christ's advent, his parousia, his coming for all of us should be our supreme happiness, especially when we know that we must die. In the scripture, we're told that it is the blessed hope, the happy hope in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And Paul, you notice, even applies it to himself. In verse 17 here, in this chapter, he says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Notice he says, we, 
we who are alive and remain. Now, of course, here he doesn't mean that, uh, that he knew that Jesus would come in his own lifetime, but he did understand that it was a real possibility. That's why he includes himself. Now, God not only wants you to apply the second coming to yourself, but also he wants you to distribute the, the parousia sunshine to others within the congregation. That's why he concludes this section with a command. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. As has often been said, whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you know it, there is a reason it is therefore. So Christ's coming isn't guesstimating, it's not speculation, it's not a hunch, it's not just simply a good idea that may or may not come to pass, but it is something that will certainly come about for your comfort, for your happiness, for your joy. Now our chapter advertises four comforts, not just one. The first three are explicit, and the last one is implicit. But each one of them should produce lively one-anothering within the congregation. First of all, Christ will return for you. Secondly, you'll be resurrected when he returns for you. Thirdly, you'll be raptured to Christ in, in, in the air with him forever when he returns for you. And notice, uh, it's not that you're raptured to be in the air forever, but rather you're raptured to be with Christ who is in the air. We'll get back to that later. And then finally, you'll be with Christ forever in the new heavens and in the new earth when he returns for you. There's a lot of comfort in those words. Remember, the, one of the purposes of the gospel is to disturb the comfortable and also to comfort the disturbed. And these Thessalonians were exceedingly rocked. They were, they were demoralized. Their hearts, it's like their hearts were ripped out of them. And the reason, well, the principal reason, is that they imagined that their dead, those Christians that, that were parts of their biological family or those Christians within the congregation, that their dead somehow or another would miss out on the resurrection train when it comes, or I should say the second coming train. So you see, a major one another in responsibility that we have is to comfort each other, not, by, uh, not so much by the sentimental wishes of a Hallmark card, but by the words, the words that are found here in this chapter. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the background. The Lord used Paul to found the church in Thessalonica during his second missionary journey, which was around 52, 53 AD. You can read about that in Acts chapter 17, where he initially spent only three Sabbaths preaching the word of God in that town. And during those three weeks, many believed on the gospel until Paul was sort of run out of dodge, as we like to say, by uh, the rioters. And then Paul went to the Gentiles. And just a few years later, from the city of Corinth, he writes these Thessalonians. He had received information that some of them were demoralized, especially those whose loved ones had been transferred by the Lord out of the church militant into the church triumphant. And so many of them, as John Bunyan would say, were imprisoned in the castle of giant despair. In short, they were miserable. Why were they miserable? Weren't their loved ones already in heaven? Yes, that's true. But they were confused about the fate of their dead. They thought that their Christian friends would miss Christ's second coming. They thought that when you die in the Lord and your soul soars into the intermediate heaven, that that means that you'll be excluded from the second coming and perhaps even from a bodily resurrection. I say perhaps in that last part. Their idea was that Christ's advent, his parousia, will not benefit you if you're already dead. 
you'll be excluded from the great climax of all history, apparently. That was the kernel of their thinking. So to comfort us, what Paul does here is he serves up an eight-course uh, dinner in eschatology. Now notice, Paul, the Apostle Paul is not interested in pie-in-the-sky theology. His concern is 100% pastoral or practical. He's not into nosy questions about the second coming, such as the timing of it. He's not a date monger. His concern is pastoral, and so he writes them as a pastor apostle. And he tells us here that Christ's return should impact the way that we live now in the here and now of our everyday living. Now, this instructs us about something about history that I don't think we've given enough uh, credit concerning. History is determined by the future, not just by the past. The future impacts the way that you live today, this very second. And the reason I can say that is because we know, by the grace of God, what the future will be. History has sometimes been defined as hindsight of God's works of creation, redemption, and providence. But history is not only hindsight, history is foresight of God's works of creation, redemption, and providence. And especially when you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, the parousia, that's knowing something that should affect the way that you live now. As John Flavel wrote, the scriptures teach us the best way of living, the noblest way of suffering, and the most comfortable way of dying. Let's then look at some of these features of the second coming as they're delineated by the apostle. The first thing that you will zero in on today is that it is a certain comfort. Paul writes here, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. There is no doubt about it. Therefore, don't despair, he says, like those that are, live hopeless lives. Remember what hope is in the Bible. We can never hear enough about that particular word. Hope, of course, in the Bible is confident expectation of what God promises for the future. God has carved the second coming into his calendar of eschatology with a pen of a diamond. It's more engraved there than those four granite faces on Mount Rushmore. In order to prove this, he tells you, uh, we know that Jesus himself said this. Jesus said in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And this doctrine is presupposed throughout the scriptures and is broadcast in the Lord's Supper. About the Lord's Supper, remember, Paul wrote, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, Paul's confidence that this is going to happen isn't based upon hearsay. It's not founded on tradition, rumors, scuttlebutt, custom, scraps of information flying about on the trade winds, or even on vague memories of what Jesus may or may not have said. His confidence is rock solid. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, he says in verse 15. One of my uh, instructors, professors at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia was Dr. John Miller, who uh, told a story when I'll never forget. And he told of, as an unbeliever, he told the story of riding on a bus at the end of World War II. And uh, when the atomic bomb was dropped, it was the talk of the country, of course, if not the talk of the world. 
And one of the passengers on the bus suddenly cried out, we'll all be destroyed. And then uh, immediately upon this, this passenger crying those words, a sailor suddenly blurted out, no, that will never happen. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ will come first. Well, Dr. Miller was impacted mightily by the sailor's confidence. It was a sort of a gold doubloon that he deposited into the bank of his memory and never forgot. And no, and no doubt the Lord used that, among other things, to bring him to Christ a little bit later on. So the parousia, you see, is fact. History will end. The curtain will fall. The play ends. The balcony is closed or will close one day. You see, history in our fallen world doesn't continue forever, which is the uh, unbelieving what's called the cyclical view of history. The cyclical view of history is sometimes pictured by a circle. A circle just that keeps going around and around and around and around. Events just keep repeating themselves, repeating themselves continually. In fact, this is uh, perhaps even hinted at, at the celebrated, in the celebrated film, The Lion King, especially in the song, The Circle of Life. Circle of Life being there's only one circle, not two circles, God who created us, but one circle, the circle of life. Things keep reoccurring over and over and over again, and it goes on interminably. Well, Scripture teaches that history is not like that. History is linear. It has a beginning, and it has an end. And the second coming of Christ, together with the flame deluge that Peter talks about in 2 Peter, will, will end our history in this fallen world. So Paul commands us to comfort one another with these words, that is, the words of Christ. Now, there's many hollow words that are spoken. Recently, I heard a commentator speak about, he was talking about death, and this commentator referred to it as a dirt nap. Well, I had never heard that one before, a dirt nap. That wasn't very comforting to hear that that's what death is, just a dirt nap. And that hardly measures up to 1 Thessalonians 4. Consider some of the pagan statements from the Greeks that were, uh, that were uh, in vogue uh, during the time of Paul. For example, Socrates said this, death may be the greatest of all human blessings. Death, a blessing? Now, I know why Socrates said that, because he didn't have much use for the human body. The death has never been a blessing. Then there is the Greek uh, philosopher Theocritus, who summarized many of the contemporary ideas at that time when he said, hopes are among the living, but the dead are without hope. Once again, that clashes, does it not, with the Christian faith. The Greek historian Homer wrote, you can't embrace the dead. There are only shadows. When we die, do we suddenly become ethereal shadows? Is that the best that we can do? And then a Roman poet by the name of uh, Catullus, who lived uh, between 84 and 54 BC, he said this, when once the light of our brief day is extinguished, there is a night of endless sleep. Now, that statement by Catullus warrants a little comment. It's tricky. Catullus, you see, calls death a sleep. All right, he used the right word, but he calls it an endless sleep. That's where he gets into trouble. There is no place for the resurrection there, you see. And his definition of sleep isn't resting in Jesus as we do when we die, our bodies rest. No, for him, sleep is nothing but eternal, everlasting darkness. So you can see the uh, revolutionary impact of Paul's words here in 1 Thessalonians. Now let's look at some of the other uh, facets of the second coming. First of all, it will be a clamorous 
coming. Not a secret rapture, but a clamorous. There's a shout, for example. The Lord will descend with a shout or a command. This is Jesus Christ himself who does the shout. He declared in the fifth chapter of John, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The shout is a victory shout. The dead hear Christ's command. So Jesus himself shouts. Just as the Israelites shouted and the walls of Jericho collapsed, and so all the walls of all the mausoleums and the heights of all the Egyptian pyramids will topple when the Lord appears. And those that have died at sea, those that have died, for example, let's say out where the Mariana Straits, which go down about seven miles, they will, the sea, that sea will give up her dead as well at, in obedience to the sovereign command of Christ. And then there's the clarion voice of the archangel here. Now this archangel is Michael. And the word arch means he exercises jurisdiction over the other angels. But exactly what does the archangel do? What is his role? And what, it, what does he say? Well, what he says is not reported here. But we should think of the, archang or the archangel and, and, and uh, compare him with John the Baptist, perhaps, the, the Lord's forerunner. John the Baptist, remember, announced the majestic approach of Christ, the Lamb of God. And that's the role of the archangel as well. And then the final clamor that we have here is the trumpet blast. Most likely, God himself is the trumpeter. I've often thought, what a wonderful advertisement to learn how to blow the trumpet. But that's another story. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, we're told, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. All of us will assemble on that great day, brought up from the dead from our graves at the trumpet blast. Your bodies will be reassembled, and you, will, and you will assemble with the entire church. You'll hear it. The third thing I want you to, to focus in on today is that the, this comfort is, a comfort is a conquering comfort. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, of course, the, the scriptures teach that the wicked will also be resurrected. In fact, the, the wicked will be resurrected at the same time as us. But the wicked are not mentioned here because the wicked will be raised up from the dead on the basis of a different principle. So there's no uh, justification here for two resurrections, as some say. The word first means that Christ's first concern at his, re uh, first, uh, concern at his return are those who are dead in Christ not so much the contemporary living generation. Better, our happiness is that our dead are raised first. They are benefited first. If you die before the contemporary generation, you will be benefited first. And Christ's resurrection power will showcase his omnipotence. The dead are quickened. God sovereignly weaves all of our skeletons back together again, and we are rocketed out of our graves at that time. If you make your home in a watery grave or in the uttermost parts of the earth, even if you have become stardust as a result of an explosion of some sort, you will be raised. In fact, there's another cardinal point here that we shouldn't slide under the radar. Notice it says, the dead are dead in Christ. Now, that is significant. and Here's why. At death, your body is so important to the Lord that it remains united with Christ. This shows that your body is significant. Your body is not a carcass. Your body is not garbage. Your, go your body is not trash. The Shorter Catechism, in fact, teaches us in number, question 
37, the following, quoting from it, their bodies being still united to Christ do rest in their graves. So, Christian, when you die, you will sleep in Jesus, which means that your body, you see, is, is, uh, is sacred, a holy temple to the Lord. All fears of separation from your Christian friends are annihilated when you focus in upon Christ's second coming. So don't let the prospect of death kill your happiness, make you miserable, turn you into a sort of doomsday orville. In fact, God is so jealous that we have the right perspective about death and about the future that he even wants you to mock death, to taunt death, because God has run up the score, you see, against death. That's why Paul wrote, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? In fact, Philip Henry, who was the father of Matthew Henry, even had those words placed on his tombstone. Death is not a pity party because our bodies remain united to Christ and they will be resurrected. Let's also learn here that the second coming is an ocular comfort as well. There's three facts for us to consider. First, Christ's advent is physical. His advent is not ethereal. It is not ghostly. It is not dreamy. And he doesn't, Jesus is not coming back to make us ethereal. He doesn't return in a ghostly body. The same body that was killed and laid in the grave and then gloriously resurrected will return. It says here, the Lord himself, himself shall return. So certainly we learn that the Bible and Gnosticism do not agree. The Gnostic thinks that matter is unbecoming to God. But scripture teaches that the Lord is for your body. The Lord is for your body as well as your soul. Your body and your soul, that's who you are. Many years ago, I performed a funeral up north in Washington State and was, um, went to the, was asked to go to the mortuary the night before for the viewing of the body. And the uh, man that died was a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a close friend of mine. And his son was standing by the casket and he pointed down to his father and he said, that is not my father. Now, what he meant by that is his soul of his father went up to heaven and that that was not his father. I had to tell him, no, that is your father because that's who we are. We are body and soul. That's the way God made us. He received it very well. He was just trying to take comfort in the fact that his father's soul was now in the presence of the Lord. But that was his father there, you see, in the casket as well. We should always remember that, not have a low view of the body. In fact, in the scriptures, a spiritual body that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a spiritual body, that's the term that he uses, is a physical body that is so completely inhabited by the Holy Spirit that it is incapable of sin and death. A spiritual body is not a non-physical body. It is a physical body that has been perfected at the power of the resurrection to live forever. Then Christ's advent is also public. There will be no secret rapture. In Acts 1, the angel said, This same Jesus that is so taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. When the Lord returns, it will not be a, a secret rapture. He won't appear in a private place, in a, somebody's nook and cranny. When he comes, it will be in the theater of the cosmos. It will be a cosmic showstopper. And then I want you to zero in on this. This is what I particularly want to emphasize. At Christ's return, 
is also a plunge, a descent. Now here I ask, what happens after Christ's advent? Where will the church permanently reside forever? What is the final home of the Catholic Church? Well, when you examine the text, it doesn't look like there's any geography here whatsoever. All we're told is that you'll be with the Lord in the air. But the question is this, does our text leave us hanging on a cloud, sort of strumming our harps upon the clouds forever? Is heaven a foggy, ethereal existence that's detached from this terra firma? Well, there's two choices. First choice is that you'll be suspended in the air in the clouds in space. But as I said earlier, that, the text doesn't say that. It doesn't say that you'll be forever in the air. Plus, the air is not the natural place for a resurrected body. A resurrected body demands a terrestrial home. It demands solid ground. It demands the good earth. And this notion of hanging on a cloud or swinging on a star is what is, uh, uh, has been called a crystal platonic idea. Platonic being from the philosopher Plato and baptized in Christian water. But somehow or another that the material realm is beneath God and that, and that the afterlife in the future is surreal. This is uh, expressed not only by the cults, but also the, the rapture idea of many, many premillennial Christians will say that when Jesus returns, that he'll return to rapture the church out of the world for seven years, and then they will be suspended in the air. In fact, when Jesus returns later and he brings, a, he brings a, a, a people with him, many of them will be suspended in the air as well. Well, this is, a, this is a mistake. And the text tells us where we will abide in the future. Now, it is true, it does speak about the air, meeting the Lord in the air. It is very true. We cannot argue against that, certainly, and we won't try to argue against that because we would be arguing against Scripture. But let's remember this. Resurrected bodies are designed to live on the earth. The idea of a ghostly, ethereal, dreamy existence, which is portrayed by the media, Hollywood movies, and over and over again, is a crystal platonic idea and not a Christian idea. I get particularly uh, animated at this point. We're told, for example, in John chapter 21, in verse, verses 1 through 4, the following, about the church coming down. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You see, the final home of the church is down. The church comes down, not up. At death, your soul flies up into the intermediate heaven to be with Christ. But at the second coming, you come down. Now, there is information in our text today which teaches this, if you look closely enough. All you have to do is focus in on the phrase here, to meet the Lord, in verse 17. You will be taken up to meet the Lord in the air, it says. Now, here we come to the point. To meet the Lord is a Greek term of diplomacy. It was a technical expression that was used at that time to uh, speak about a public welcome of a governor or a dignitary that was coming to visit your city. Here's what happened. 
a dignitary visits your city. And so greeters are dispatched to meet the governor or the dignitary. And then what happens after that? They, they escort the dignitary back to the city. And that's what Paul is telling us. Resurrected believers will be caught up, raptured to meet the Lord in the air. And then after that, the church comes down to the new heavens and the new earth. Now there's two significant examples of this phrase, to meet the Lord, that I want to bring into this sermon this morning. My job is to try to convince you of this. In John chapter 12, there's the first one. The crowds on Palm Sunday, they came out of Jerusalem to meet Jesus. The same term is used here, to meet Jesus. Listen to verses 12 and 13. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him. And then after they met him, they returned to Jerusalem. And then there is Matthew chapter 25, verse 6, particularly applicable here. The parable of the ten virgins at the wedding feast. The bridesmaids hear the announcement, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. To meet him. And what does this mean? It means that those virgins met the bridegroom, and then they turned around and they went back to the marriage feast. So what does this all mean? What does this all add up to? It adds up to this, that our glorified bodies will not stay in the intermediate heaven, nor is our home uh, swinging on clouds like celestial chimpanzees. Your final home is, will, will be the earth, the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, as Peter writes in 2 Peter 3. When Christ returns, Heaven and earth become one because God himself will dwell with us forever. But right now, when you die, you fly up to heaven. But when Jesus returns, you'll come down and you'll descend to the new earth that will be purged by the fire of God. It's instructive to me that the Westminster Larger Catechism in question 90 speaks about the future of the Christian, and it's called, which it calls the immediate vision and fruition of God the Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit to all eternity. All three persons of the Trinity we have communion with on that day in the future. Now, I don't understand a lot of that, but it certainly reflects what Paul says in 1 Th Corinthians. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. So this is what you pray when you pray, come Lord Jesus. You pray for the immediate vision and fruition of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Once the earth has been cleansed by fire. So Christian today, our very planet will, be, will one day become heaven on earth. And it's interesting, this has, this has largely been the Reformed view. As uh, cre creedalized in the Belgic Confession, listen to John Calvin. John Calvin writes, He, Peter, reasons this way, that as heaven and earth will be cleansed by fire, so that they may be fit for the kingdom of Christ. The whole old earth will be burned by fire, cleansed by fire, and the kingdom will be planted right in this world. So the new heavens and the new earth does not mean a brand new heavens, a new earth, but one that is new in quality, one that has been refurbished, one that has been marvelously um, transformed by the power of God. Your future will not be a ghostly, airy, dreamy state but rather it will be on the new earth. So congregation, this is the blessed hope, the happy hope, and that will be the greatest day of your life, and mine as well. 
You'll be so happy that you'll do cart feel, uh, wheels and leap over walls with joy and enthusiasm. If you long for Christ's coming, then your spiritual condition is hale and hearty, just as a bride longs for the bridegroom and so the church for Christ. But here's a warning. If you're not longing for Christ's coming, then there's something wrong, very, very wrong with you, with your relationship with the Lord. You could, your spirituality could be at low ebb, or your love for the bridegroom could be faint, or perhaps absent altogether. In fact, your attitude towards Christ's second coming reflects your attitude towards his first, just as your attitude towards his first reflects upon the second. If you're cold towards the first, you'll be cold towards the second. No, all of us should be zeroed in on Christ's coming. It should be your passion. It is not unspiritual at all to want to see the Lord face to face and to be with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. May God prepare us for that great day as it, as we, as it comes so that we might live as if Jesus died yesterday, rose today, and is coming for us tomorrow. Amen.